Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy Horowitz and yep, I was awarded the Australian Museum Foundation AMRI uh, Visiting Collections Fellowship this year and um, it allowed me to take a look at the Black Coral Collection at the Australian Museum and uh, the title of this talk is the Shining a Light on Dark Taxa. It's an integrated approach to species identification of Australian Museum Black Coral Collection. And I should preface this talk by saying we know so little about uh, black corals in the world, especially in Australia, because most of the world's taxonomic experts live in the States. So this was an amazing opportunity to um, to learn more about black corals in you know this part of the world. Uh, my affiliations are James Cook University, the Center of Excellence for Corridor Studies, uh, the Museum of Tropical Queensland, and the Australian Museum Research Institute. Uh, a little background about why we know so little about biodiversity. So uh, anthropogenic drivers are threatening biodiversity on a global scale. Um, we don't know how many species live on Earth, somewhere between you know, half a million and 10 million species live on Earth. And what's worse is that we don't know what we don't know. And by that, I mean, you know, uh, studies have estimated somewhere between 3% and 96% of species aren't yet even described. And what that means is that we know very little about biodiversity, and it also makes it really challenging to uh, create conservation interventions to, you know, target areas or, or specific species that need the most protection. So um, why do we know so little about biodiversity? Obviously, this talk will be in the marine realm. Um, we've been scuba diving. Um, it's been mainstream for about 75 years. So uh, between, you know, between zero and about 20 meters depth, most people can dive down and so we know a lot about the shallowest of marine habitats. Uh, in the last few 50 years or so, uh, we've created uh, new technologies to dive hundreds of meters. So this is a drawing of a closed circuit rebreather um, and so it allows you to recirculate your air so you could stay uh, longer and dive deeper. And we also now have the ability to um, go on research vessels and use remotely operated vehicles, which can dive thousands of meters. Uh, but of course, there aren't many ROVs in the world, especially ones that can dive down really deep. And um, you need a high level of expertise to scuba dive yourself down just 100 meters. So most of what we know is this first 20 meters of depth. And so uh, a question I had really early on when I started studying black corals is what proportion of the marine habitat is represented by this 20 meters of depth? So I took the uh, depth at every latitude longitude degree um, using a bathymetric map and I made a histogram and um, just with depth on the X and percentage of ocean coverage on the right uh, with bins at 20 meters, that first bar represents zero to 20 meters of depth. And so what this tells us is we know a lot uh, about 1% of the ocean, and this is the rest. So uh, we don't know much about biodiversity for the majority of the ocean. All that we don't know about biodiversity are known as these biodiversity shortfalls. And uh, there's more than three, but the three main ones and the ones that I've worked on are the uh, Linnaean shortfall, which represents our lack of knowledge about known species. So this is identified, uh, named after Carl Linnaeus, who formalized binomial nomenclature. And so he described how we go about describing species. Uh, the Wallachian shortfall, which represents our lack of knowledge about species distributions. And that was named after Alfred Wallace, who independently came up with the theory of evolution through natural selection. And he also prompted Darwin to publish on the origin of the species and the Darwinian shortfall, which represents our lack of knowledge about species and molecular relationships and evolutionary histories of species. And of course, that was named after Charles Darwin, who's the first person to think about evolution in terms of a tree. Um, and it's how we think about evolution today. It's really important to identify, to understand biodiversity better because it enables us to identify these ecological and evolutionary processes that maintain biodiversity patterns. And these are really important to identify because then you could target those specific processes and design conservation interventions to uh, protect those processes and therefore preserve biodiversity. Uh, if we wanna go out and learn more about what's living in the ocean, it's really challenging to just go out and you know, collect representatives from all over the world or even within uh, an area like the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, but what you can do is go visit a museum collection. 
So they're an inexpensive alternative. Um, they often represent biodiversity of the Gibbon region. Uh, they're often preserved in some way where you could extract DNA from it. And uh, each jar contains documentation of the history of the specimen. So, you know, who described it, where it came from, uh, the species ID, and, you know, uh, how the species ID has been updated through time. Um, and lastly, this is also the location where most holotype specimens live. I'm probably preaching to the choir, but a holotype specimen is uh, the specific specimen from which a species description was based. And so it's really important to refer back to these holotype specimens when either describing new species or identifying a specimen to the species level. The Australian Museum Research Institute has over 20 million specimens collected over the last 190 years. I did a quick Google search and one of the largest coral collections of Australian fauna in the world. And they even have over 200 black coral samples representing a 130 year collection. Um, and looking at a printout of the specimens in the museum collection before my visit, half of the specimens weren't identified to the family level and 30 specimens were identified to the species level. And I said it before, but we know so little about black corals in Australia that every collection, especially one as large and well preserved as this, represents you know, a treasure trove of biodiversity information. And so therefore, yep, we have the uh, opportunity here to update knowledge about biodiversity ranges um, to and within Australian waters. Uh, black corals. OK, um, so black corals um, in the order Antipatheria are um, found. I think I lost my. You're still sharing your screen, but maybe if you just. Yeah, there ah, you go. I'm back. OK, so uh, black corals are found all over the world in all habitats from depths from just below the surface, uh, which surprises some people to over 8000 meters deep. Uh, they can be really large and branching like in the shallow waters uh, like in like in the first image uh, they can be really small and intricate like in the second image uh, they have polyps or feeding mouths uh, in the third top and bottom images they can be really small polyps or really large and they have these characteristic skeletal spines that are really informative in identifying species uh, but of course they're really small so there's less than a millimeter uh, tall and so you need a scanning electron microscope to uh, view and measure these really informative features. To place black corals in the amphizoa, uh, black corals are hexacorals. People often confuse black corals with soft corals, which are in the octocorelia, but uh, black corals have six tentacles and uh, soft corals have eight tentacles. Um, previously, uh, it was thought that black corals were really closely related to the tube anemones. Uh, so much so, they even created an entire group just for these two orders called the Seranti Antipatheria. But we now know that black corals are related to hard corals and the corallomorphs. And the actinarians are sister to the black corals, corallomorphs, and sclerotinians as one group. Um, it's really hard identifying a black coral species. Uh, and that's because they don't have, they have a few morphological features, but there's lots of overlapping features between species, genera, and even families. And what was previously thought as an informative feature was whether a uh, coral branches or if it's unbranched or whip. So we have a picture uh, outlined in blue, that's the branching black coral, and then the red one's the whip black coral. And behind is a phylogenetic tree that depicts uh, molecular relationships between species. And this is what was assumed before we started sequencing species, where uh, all the whip corals would be in one clade or in one natural group and branching black corals would um, be separate. But after sequencing a whole bunch of species, um, this is more of what we found. And so you can see these whip corals popping up um, in different parts of the tree. And what this tells us is that, well, one, it's not an informative feature in separating species, genera, or even families. There's two different families here. Um, but yet we don't know um, it, it, what it means is that the whip coral morphology has evolved multiple times over evolutionary history and it's not an informative feature. So um, what I've been doing for a big part of my PhD is getting actual specimens, either collecting them or using museum specimens, uh, identifying them morphologically 
and sequencing them to get some molecular um, uh, data, and then use those two lines of evidence to identify specimens to the species level. And what this has enabled me to do is um, increase our knowledge about the numbers of species that live in Australian waters, expand the ranges of species, and also describe a ton of new species. And I'll, I'll do a little more specific um, information about the methods here. So morphological identification, um, I use three different features generally, um, although at the species level, certain features are informative. Uh, one is the gross morphological features. So whether it branches or whether it's unbranched, uh, it's not too informative, but also whether it has branches or what we call pinules, which are repeated branches along the stem or prior branch. And um, if you think of a fern, a fern has pinules. And um, the polyp characteristics, so the tentacles surround the feeding mouth and the size of the polyp, the distance between two polyps, uh, the orientation of the tentacles around the polyp, uh, the length of the, of the tentacles. So these are all different little morphometrics that we could use to separate uh, species. And as I mentioned, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, uh, the spines are a really informative feature. So the middle image is a zoomed out view of a, of a skeleton using a scanning electron microscope. And on um, the corners are different species. And so you can see, um, even though a coral may look really similar from a gross morphological perspective, when you look at the spines, they can be really different and really useful um, in doing taxonomy. The molecular method that I've been using for my PhD are ultra-conserved elements. I'll give a brief background on UCEs. Um, so as the name implies, they're ultra conserved. And what that means is, is that these regions of the genome evolve so slowly through hundreds of millions of years that you could actually match up these identical regions among highly divergent taxa. Uh, obviously, uh, comparing identical regions of the genome isn't going to be very informative. They're going to say they're all the same. But uh, the image on the right, you could see um, as you move away from these UCE regions towards what we call flanking regions, variability in base pairs increases. So we grab the UCE and flanking regions, line those up, and we can um, detect differences between species. And what's useful about UCEs compared to a single locus marker is that there's thousands of UCEs in a given genome. So that means we have thousands of loci, thousands of alignments to use um, to provide really strong bootstrap support um, in our resulting phylogenies. So we had uh, two weeks at the Australian Museum Research Institute, and the main aims of this um, project were to, one, digitize the collection. Uh, we spent most of the two weeks really just going through the collection and you know just sorting them and seeing what was in there. So uh, we now have a digital collection. So if someone at a later date wants to look at the black corals, all they need to do is look at wherever the digital collection is stored. Um, identify the specimens morphologically, uh, subsample skeletons for scanning electron microscopy, and also subsampling tissue for UCE sequencing. And using that information to just identify the species and update what we know about biodiversity in Australia. Step one was to open the jars. So um, as I mentioned, this is a really old collection um, and some of the samples have been unopened since they were first jarred. So this sample is from 1911 and it most likely hasn't been opened uh, since then. So Steve and I, we had to crack a few of the jars just to open them. And uh, so we went through the collection and took out samples at one, one at a time and we imaged each sample. We then described the morphological features, so as I mentioned, uh, the gross morphological features, the polyps, um, and the spines were looked at later. Um, and so we had a, a table of every specimen and its morphological features and its associated image. And um, next step was to subsample for sequencing um, and also for SEM, uh, for taking SEM. So we have an SEM here at Museum of Tropical Queensland. So um, it was it took weeks to take SEMs of all the specimens that we wanted to SEM. So it made more sense to bring the samples back here and then spend it was it's been a month now of SEMing of the of the 90 to 100 samples that we've subsampled. Uh, 
And um, so here's the SCM MTQ. And so Savannah on the left and Abba on the right were really helpful in uh, assisting with taking all of these SCMs. And so here's some of the overall results to date. Um, so out of the 210 specimens um, that we looked at, 126 had family and genus level updates. Uh, it's a pretty big um, overhaul of you know, what we thought we knew about the collection and then two weeks later. And 90 specimens were subsampled for SCM and UCE. And um, we've, yep, we've now updated, uh, we've now taken SCMs of all these 90 samples and we're working on identifying the species. I'm finishing my PhD in December, so I'm trying to part my time on these two different projects, but early next year I should have um, more species names and also we're sending off DNA for sequencing. And so that means early next year we're going to have morphological um, IDs based on the morphologies and also really good sequence data to match up to um, already sequenced specimens to have a lot of information to pin a species name or describe a new species in this collection. Here are the, some of the really cool highlights uh, that we found over these two weeks. So um, as I mentioned, soft corals and black corals are often confused for one another. And in this collection, we found a bunch of soft corals were actually black corals and uh, black corals are actually soft corals. So here's a sample that was initially identified as a soft coral. And we, um, well, we looked at it and identified as a black coral. Uh, so we moved it over to the black coral section of the wet lab. We took subsamples of this specimen and we took SEMs. Here's an SEM of the sample. Soft and black corals, things identified as black corals that were actually soft corals. So what we were able to do is take it out of the black coral section of the of the store and put it in the soft coral area for a soft coral expert to work on. Um, when first going to the Australian Museum, I really wasn't expecting to actually work on any holotype specimens, uh, but we actually found two in the collection, which is really exciting. Um, this is a, a species in the genus Seropathius, and here's the actual full colony. It's really well preserved, uh, really big. And so I've been standing on the ladder here and you can see the inset image. You can see that it has its polyps and tissue like perfectly preserved. So we took a subsample and we'll um, try to sequence this old holotype from, from 1889. So here's the original description. Here, here's a, a figure in the description that shows the skeletal spine features. And uh, it's a great drawing, but it's really hard to tell um, what the spines look at or ornamentation that's on these spines. So we were able to, for the first time, take a look at the spines of this holotype specimen. And this is what it looks like. So you could see that it has ornamentation on from the tip to about midway down each spine. And that's a really important feature that probably wasn't very clear in the original description. And so now what we could do is, well, one, re-describe the species with this new information and sequence data. Uh, but two, look at other whip corals that have also been described that might actually have these exact same features. And we could then you know, synonymize them if they're the same species. We also found new species, which is always very exciting. Um, I've done, I've worked in a few different museums providing curatorial assistance, and every museum I come across, there's always undescribed species, and the Australian Museum is no different. So this specimen was collected by Penny from the Tasman Sea um, at 500 meters depth. And um, you could see, if you look closely, you could see that the branches, or we call it pinules, have, they're alternating. Um, and to us that will tell you that it probably belongs in um, in the alternatopathies, in the genus alter alternatopathies. Um, and we took a skeletal spine image, uh, which is that second image. And so the spines would suggest that it's a new species, but really the gross morphological features really scream it's a new species. So here's an image on the left of the typical alternatopathies that um, among the described species in the genus. And all of the species have these really long, unpinulated branches, uh, stems, sorry. And in this new species, the stem is really quite short. Um, so that was the first indication that it was a new species. But then looking at the spines, it, the spines are much more rounded than the other species in this genus. So uh, we have a lot of evidence to support it, describing it as a new species. But we'll also try to um, sequence the specimen.
we um, there's all these really cool abyssal adaptations that I just wanted to talk about. I think some of you are interested in. Um, so all most species in the order have these basal plates and they attach to hard substrate. Uh, but in the collection, we actually found a species and it's one of three species that don't have this basal plate. Instead, they have this basal hook and this basal hook allows it to actually uh, settle and grow where hard substrate isn't present. That's a really cool adaptation because this is an abyssal species. Um, so it makes sense where there's very limited hard habitat for these kinds of adaptations to occur. Uh, but what's interesting is that um, I've recently time calibrated one of my phylogenies, including this lineage, and it's only 30 million years old. And you may think that's a long time, but black corals have been around for over 400 million years. So uh, we also know that black corals originated in the shallows, you know, um, shallower than a thousand meters depth. And this is a specimen um, that's commonly found in the abyss, you know, in up to four or six thousand meters. So what this tells us is that it's taken about 400 million years for black corals to invade offshore heading towards the abyss. And it's taken that time probably because they've had to modify or adapt with these uh, abyssal morphological features in order to survive where nutrients are less and notably here where there's a very limited hard substrate. And so this is probably a recent, this is probably indications of, you know, more species diversify in this habitat now that it's established populations um, in the deep. And we even, we even found this exact same species uh, in Western Australia. So we were on a trip um, in Cocos and Crispus Island uh, with some of the Australian Museum uh, researchers, and we found the really beautiful um, Schizopathies affinis, which is what this is. So we now know that it actually occurs not only in the GBR um, in Coral Sea, but also on Western Australia as well. Um, so some of the summaries. So this fellowship um, allowed me to update species identifications, which is really always very uh, good for a group that doesn't have a lot of work on it. And so we're able to update knowledge about species living in Australian waters and their ranges. Uh, excitingly, we were also we will also be able to redescribe species that were described in the late 1800s, which is really important to do. We, ne we now have new technology to better understand what a species is and how it relates to other species. And of course, we're going to be describing a whole bunch of new species from this collection specifically. Um, and we'll also sequence the specimens to understand how they're related molecularly. And so generally, we're going to update knowledge about biodiversity and taxonomy of black corals in Australia. And the whole purpose of this is to have a better understanding about biodiversity, you know, not just in the shallows, but also, you know, on the slope and in the abyss and to have, give managers more information to, to, to make informed conservation decisions when the time comes to, you know, better preserve our biodiversity. I want to thank um, Steve, Leticia, Ingo, Penny, Elena, Megan, and Claire. Uh, they made me feel really comfortable, uh, Christina and I, when we were at the Australian Museum. And also my MTQ team, Savannah and Abba, um, for helping with SEMs and also helping work on some of the specimens. And Tom Bridge and Peter Cowman um, and the rest of the MTQ team. And lastly, of course, the AMF AMRI Visited Collections Fellowship. Thank you for funding this research.